Makoto, ko Danielle Gatland aho no Tamaki Makoto aho. Uh, I'm Danielle Gatland, I'm from Auckland, and it's my pleasure to talk today about building data collection apps with QGIS. Um, I think a lot of us have heard uh, in the last couple of days about QField, so a lot of people are using that, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about Merge and Maps, which is another option that you can use. So this is just a really high level summary of the two apps and it kind of summarizes that they're very similar. <laughs> um, talking to people around um, the conference the last few days, it seems like it probably just comes down to whichever app you actually prefer using. Um, but they both enable like um, cloud or offline syncing probably is the wrong word, but you can um, sync them both through the cloud. You can also uh, use the apps offline and then sync them later when you're back online. Um, They've got slightly different pricing schemes if you want to use their cloud syncing services, but you can also set up your own private um, servers to sync your data through, in which case you can just use the apps for free. Um, yeah, and they've both got uh, academia and nonprofit or char uh, charity plans as well. So if you're doing work um, in those areas and you want to use their cloud syncing um, options, then you can do that for a cheaper version than the professional plan. Cool, this is kind of boring, but this is just the steps that you go through when you're building a data collection app. Um, I should have said my presentation today is basically like a tutorial for how to set one up. Uh, so if you've done this before, it should all be very um, familiar to you. And if you haven't, you should know exactly what to do by the time I'm finished speaking. <laughs> all right, so what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna walk through this whole process today. So we're gonna design a really simple survey um, learn how to set up the project, how to set up the data form for people, um, learn how to check that the form is set up correctly, uh, syncing your project, and then going out and actually collecting your data, and then what you might do with your data afterwards. It might involve maps. Cool, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on survey design. Um, I am not an expert in survey design, but I know it's really important um, in terms of uh, like surveys where you might ask people a questionnaire, it's obviously important in terms of how you phrase questions and the order of questions. And I think a lot of that translates across to um, spatial data collection. So thinking about the order of your questions, uh, the phrasing of your questions, if you're doing drop downs, how many options you have, um, how you distinguish between options, ideally in a small number of words. Um, I have found with some of these apps that they get really confusing and hard to use when you've got really long, wordy questions. Uh, you lose some of the context sometimes, so trying to be short and snappy, and that's also easier for the people out in the field collecting data. Yeah, so how many questions you wanna have, what types of inputs, can you automate anything with default values, is anything required? Um, yeah, all of those kinds of things. So, for our example survey today, it's very basic. We're obviously going to collect some location data. Um, we're gonna collect points today, but both apps also enable you to do lines and polygons. Um, we're gonna have a drop down. We're gonna make some notes. Uh, we're gonna allow people to put photos into their app. And then we're gonna autofill the username and the date of collection from our auditors. All right, so setting up the project. I kind of jumped a little bit ahead here because I think most people use QGIS, but if you've got a project open, um, and you create a data layer, and that would be points or lines or polygons, whatever you want to collect, and you jump into the properties, and then you see something like this. So we set up the fields that we want to collect. Um, it's important here to think about the length of any text strings you put in based on whether people are gonna be writing paragraphs and paragraphs of text, or you're gonna have drop downs, then you can make your field length shorter. I didn't think very hard for my example. I just threw in some placeholders, but that is one to, um, carefully about. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an attribute form. So this is something I hadn't come across until I had to do this data collection app because previously I mostly just uh, like styled data that already existed. So what we do here is I use the drag and drop designer. So this is still in the layer properties panel of your project. Um, and I just drag and drop the fields that I want in my form from uh, the left side there and to the right hand side. So you'll see there we've got uh, footpath quality, notes and photo. And I have not dragged across username and date time 
because I don't want that in my form. I'm going to auto populate those fields. Um, you can also in here create sections and you can do that either as sections within the same page, in which case there'll be like a little heading, or you can do it as two separate tabs, in which case you will switch between the tabs to see the data um, for each of those sections. And I think you can mix and match those things as well. Um, and those would be added with the green plus. Cool, so drop downs. Again, this will be really obvious to some people, but I had to do some Googling to figure it out myself. Um, value map is what you want for a drop down. So you've got two sets of fields in here. Um, on the left hand side, it is the attribute value that you will store in your data tables. And on the right hand side, you might have some extra text that explains what you actually mean by that for your collectors. So this is an example for uh, a data collection app for auditing the accessibility of footpaths. So we've got good means the footpath is flat. Uh, it also means it's even and wide. Um, marginal means it might be a little bit uneven or bumpy or that kind of thing. And then poor just means it's really uneven and bumpy um, in these examples anyway. And then missing means there's no footpath at all. And that's something that's really important for accessibility of footpaths. Sorry, accessibility of sort of spaces, especially for people that need footpaths or need flat spaces to walk on. Cool, our notes section, this kind of just sets itself up. The only thing you want to do is tick multi-line. <laughs> um, if you don't tick that, this is, the way I use notes is it's just my auditors can write whatever they want to do when they're out in the, whatever they want to when they're out in the field. So it can be quite lengthy sometimes if they need to record something that's going on in the neighborhood or they want to record something specific about what the weather was like on the day. Um, if you don't tick multi-line, then their text box will just be like one um, sort of word high, I guess. And then either, depending on the app you're using and versions and stuff, either it'll continue to like slide to the right and they'll see the most recent words, or it'll just keep typing and they won't be able to see what they're typing anymore and that's not super helpful. So <laughs> easy solution, but also easy to forget to do. Great, so photos, um, this is, Probably the most powerful thing about this whole process is the ability to have your photos automatically, well, yeah, automatically linked to your points by the time I receive the data, as an analyst at least. Um, again, this is relatively simple once you know the few boxes you need to tick. So I, as you've probably noticed from the other slides, have put orange boxes around all the things I think are important. Um, so we select the like type for this field is an attachment. Um, and I've set in here to store it as a file path relative to my project path. Um, the way I've set this project up is the photos will just be stored within the same directory as my project. Um, I've not set up subfolders or anything like that. And that is because the projects I build this for are relatively small. Um, we do sort of like accessibility audits in town centers and the like. And so I don't need to worry too much about file management or things getting too uh, big or unwieldy. And then finally at the bottom, just putting that type into image to make sure that you're in QGIS and the app and everything, we know that it's an image we want and it's an image um, when it comes into the app, it's going to give you the camera and the ability to take a photo. So a couple of extra tips and tricks about photos. Uh, and this is where we differentiate between, yeah, between QField and Merge and Maps. Um, but something else that comes up is when you take photos on your smartphone, a lot of us have pretty good smartphones these days, they take really good photos, and they take up a lot of memory. Um, and that is kind of problematic if you're pay paying for a cloud server and you're using up all of the storage for unnecessarily high quality photos, um, or just if you have memory constraints on your device. So on the top left, you can see the settings you need to use in Merge and Maps to adjust the quality of your photos. Um, I always set mine to low, and even in low quality, I can open those images in like a 17, 18 inch monitor and they look perfectly crisp. So that's more than good enough for the applications that I have. Um, and then in the bottom right image, which is a little bit behind the other one, you can see in QField, you can set um, the maximum image size in pixels. And I think that's the maximum in width or height. It might apply to both, but it keeps the aspect. 
Um, one thing to note with these photos settings is that they're in your project properties, not your layer properties. So every time I set up a project, I forget, and I think the option is gone. <laughs> but no, it's there, and it's just in your project properties. Cool, automated fields. We're flying through this. I'm probably speaking too fast, sorry. Anyway, um, automated fields, so this, for my purposes, we don't really need automated fields, but it feels like a good safety net in case you ever have issues with your data that you can chase up um, who collected some data or when they collected it or when they modified it. So in the top left, we have, again, this is another area where the two um, apps differ, but we have how you can create, uh, how you can automatically populate the username. So merge and match, you go at merge and underscore username. Um, and then for Q field, it's at user underscore account underscore name. Very similar things, but uh, those will both auto fill. And if you can see one of the screens properly, you can see my usernames for both of those uh, <laughs> cloud servers. So dgatland underscore MRC is one and dgatland is the other. Um, and so it shows you that um, like example of what it would show. So you can make sure you've put the right expression in. And on both of those, I've ticked the box um, to say um, update it when the data is updated. So that means it will always show who modified it most recently. You could have that as two separate fields, like one for who created it and leave that unticked, and then one for who modified it. Um, yeah. And then the other box I've got over on the right here is setting the time. So that's just now standard Python. Um, and again, I've got that ticked to update every time. Um, what I will go backwards. No, I won't go backwards because I'm going to struggle to find it. But um, those, I have just done tiny little screenshots because I didn't want to give you a massive screenshot and point you to one tiny bit. But in your attribute form, um, the place that you set this up is right at the bottom on the right-hand side. So similar to where we set our um, value map for our drop-downs, and where we set all our photo settings at the bottom of that, you can put in an expression for your default values. And you could also show this to the user in the app. You could add it in the attribute form if you want them to see it. It's not a secret. Um, and you can also put it there, I think, as like an uneditable field so that they can see it, but they can't change it if they want to pretend they're someone else. Cool, I feel like this is pretty obvious, but <laughs> try it out. Um, the simplest way to check it is, well, probably the first way you should check it is to check it in your QGIS project itself. So put your layer into edit mode, drop a point in or a shape in or whatever you're collecting, and have a look at the attributes form that comes up. Should be what you want it to be. This looks like what I set up, a drop down, a long text box, and then an image where I have loaded in a logo that no one here will recognize. <laughs> Um, and then also you can check your attributes table to make sure that that's filled in properly with everything you wanted. Um, particularly, I did that here just to make sure my username and the date and time came through correctly. And then I deleted my point because I didn't want my users to see it when they went and did their audit, um, and then synced it to the cloud. So unsurprisingly, both of these services use QGIS plugins. Um, you just go to the plugin toolbox and load them in. Um, I've put in there in the orange boxes. So the top one is Merge and Maps, the bottom one is Q Field, and they each um, come with like a little panel in your taskbar of a series of buttons. Um, and basically for both of them, you can just follow those buttons from the left to the right when you want to deploy a project. Um, Q Field's a little different because it's got sort of options for whether you're using uh, Q Field for cloud or not, but it's very simple. You just load them in and hover on the buttons if you want the information and just click on them and follow them through. You can't really go wrong. Cool, so then we're gonna collect our data. Um, I've got a couple of videos here. So this is Merge and Maps. Um, I also have it on my phone if anyone wants to see it in action um, after this. But this is basically what it looks like. You, I've got the project already open here. You load up your project, you zoom around, you have a, like a little target icon so you can see where you're adding your point or your line and you fill in your information. It's a really crisp and clean form. It's very easy to use. Um, yeah, I will jump ahead now. We don't need to watch the whole video, I don't think. 
Similarly, here's a video of Q field. So you'll notice pretty quickly that it looks a little bit different, but it also looks very similar. Um, as far as I need, they both have the same kind of functionalities and they're both easy to use. They both have apps on Android and on iOS. And someone mentioned to me the other day, Windows, um, like tablets and things. Can't remember which apps, but at least one of them <laughs> is available on Windows tablets as well. Cool. Qfield, thank you. Qfield uh, is available on Windows tablets. And Mergen, hey. I was actually gonna say earlier, so Simon, um, my heckler over here, <laughs> is very experienced with Qfield and also with um, like setting up private servers for Qfield syncing. And then Steven at the back, the other heckler, is quite experienced with Mergen maps. So I think they have both done a lot more in these apps than I have, so feel free to hassle them as well as me. Um, I know there are a few others in the room as well, but those are the two that I know the best. <laughs> cool. Um, so then we jump into producing outputs. And this is a very basic online map that I produced the first time I made these tools. Um, for this, I used uh, QGIS to web plugin, but mm, typically I use uh, Python and just build some dash apps in Python because that's my comfortable place. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, this is a nice way to be able to provide to your um, client or customer or just user of your data a really simple way to view the data. It's intuitive. Um, it's easy to see where the data was collected. Uh, in other versions of similar apps, I've um, like colored, for example, in my demo app, we talked about different footpath qualities. Uh, I've colored these by the quality of footpath. And that's really nice, for example, for councils to have a look and target like, where am I missing footpaths or where are my really poor footpaths? And the other output we always do, this is a bit boring, but it's just a report. It's basically like an index of all of the data we might have collected on a specific audit. Uh, typically, we would do this as like one page per data point that we collected. And you can see how we lay it out. It's typically a table. You probably can't read it and that was kind of intentional. It doesn't matter what the words are. <laughs> it just matters like the, the idea. Um, so there's like a table of the data that we collected. And then if there were any really long text fields, that gets pulled out and just dropped in um, to the document separately. And then under that, we include any images that were taken in the data collection process. Um, this reporting is done as like post-processing in Python, because again, it's my comfortable place. Um, but it was not too hard to do, and it just grabs everything in the geo package we created from the app and turns it into a Word document that my colleagues can put as an appendix in their report. And probably no one looks at it, but if they want to, they can, and it did not waste a lot of my time to create. <laughs> That is it. Try it out. They're great. <laughs> Hi there. Um, you mentioned uh, with the uh, with the app that there is a cost to using them if you're using their cloud sync tools. Um, if you're hosting yourself, uh, so with your organization's implementation, are you? Uh, using the paid version or are you guys uh, syncing it yourself? Yeah, we use the paid version. Um, we typically do maybe like three or four audits a year and we only need the data storage for like one to two months. So for us, it's probably not worth the cost of uh, setting up our own server. Uh, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, oh, hello. Um, I was one, I've got a couple of field teams out using Qfield actively. Uh, um, one of the things I'm getting back is that um, it's bugging out with the external GPS. It's working well with an internal GPS. Uh, I was just wondering whether you or maybe anyone else has also had issues with them. Um, you know, we need submeter RCK points usually. So yeah. yeah, I have no experience with that, but nope, Simon doesn't either. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe if anyone else knows, they can come and find you after. Thank you all. Um, I'm Q Danielle, and Q 